So we stopped with Nadar and his interest in photographing celebrities. So he was the first to be a celebrity photographer. He was groundbreaking and he photographed Sarah Barnhart, who was, at the time was a world famous uh, theatrical actress, um, an actress of the stage. So he, he convinced her to pose without her costume on and got this iconic photograph of Sarah Barnhart. So the next super important person in photography is a woman, and her name is Julia Margaret Cameron. Um, she, she really wanted to reveal the inner spirit of the person, their, their, the, the personality of the sitter, of the subject. Um, and... She was, uh, she was a pretty remarkable woman. First of all, she was born rich, really rich. She married into more wealth. She raised a family. And after all her kids were grown and gone, she decided to take up photography as a hobby. Yeah, a hobby. We'll put that in quotes. Um, and she did several things that were essential to the advancement of photography. Um, number one, she got influential people to look at photography differently, more as an art form. Two, she developed processes to combine the best of the daguerreotype and the best of the calotype, which was reproducible, um, into, wow, the collodion wet plate process. Plus, she invented all of the techniques we use um, that we use today in photography. Uh, camera angles, uh, lighting techniques, uh, posing, and use of props. She was the very first genius of photography and she was a woman. So let's look at a little bit of her work here. Um, she, here he, she is, she's used some props as she takes a photograph of this little child. Um, and uh, here she's photographed. She liked to also tell stories with her work. Uh, so she would do a scene, say, from a poem or a book um, and use props to, to do that. And she was really good at showing how, how people were, um, what their personality was. And it's really interesting because I saw a, uh, I saw a, a, history channel thing on photo like a documentary on photography and the narrator was saying oh isn't it a shame julia margaret cameron she never sold one photograph and she never had a gallery exhibition of her work well here's the deal she was so rich she didn't need to sell anything in fact it would have been pretty like rude or or in poor taste for her to even ask for money I mean, the people she was hanging out with were like kings and queens and like the other richest people and influential people in the world. She had money to travel all over to take her photographs. And because she invented this process that kind of combined the best of the daguerreotype and the calotype, um, she, this collodion wet plate process made photography portable so you didn't have to be stuck in a studio any longer you could take your camera and your equipment out with you and uh, and take photographs out wherever you wanted to on on location so that was kind of a big deal right um, and <clears throat> and because she invented all these processes uh, she really is the a genius of photography, and the fact that she's a woman is even pretty is is pretty cool. So she she opens up the door for the next really important um, person in photography um, that really changed the world with their with their with what they were doing. Um, and here's the process of the collodion wet plate. So she um, she did this process that shortened the process quite a bit. Uh, and made it portable. So when the, the, when the daguerreotype had like 10 different things you had to do, the collodion wet plate was four different things. So it was not such a big deal. Um, and the callotype was the process of, you know, developing a, a negative and then pre-printing it still had a lot of step, more steps to it. So she was able to do this. So she opens the door to this guy. 
Um, and this is a man who did something no one else had ever done, Matthew Brady. He had the idea to photograph the war. The very first war to ever be photographed was the American Civil War. Before this, all coverage of war was illustrated by artists, right? You needed a photograph or you, or you needed an image to go with a story, and say in a magazine or a newspaper, you asked an artist to do it. Um, and usually this was from their imaginations. The editor would uh, need a, a picture for a story of, of such and such a battle, and the artist who, who, uh, who knew what the uniforms looked like would just kind of illustrate it from their imagination or maybe from some details. No problem, right? This was done all the time. Um, so this was the very first war to be photographed, and it was kind of a big deal. Um, and uh, we'll look at it. So this was an illustration for a, a battle in the War of 1812. Um, before the invention of photography. So the artist would, would do an illustration. And I want you to remember that um, back then, when most of the times when people went to war, um, the armies would line up um, on, on opposite sides of a field, right? You'd have rows and rows of, of soldiers lined up, and, the and they would start marching forward, and the first row would, would stop, and they would all take their guns and shoot at each other. And when all those guys, like, dropped dead... Right, the second row would step forward and they'd shoot each other. When those guys dropped dead, right, the third row would march forward and shoot each other. So it was kind of it was kind of a stylized battle. It's not the kind of warfare that we're thinking of today. Um, and not only that, people knew about when and where the battles were taking place. So it was easy for the photographer um, to go to go and photograph a battle. It wasn't that big of a deal anymore. And by this time, the the exposure times had been greatly lowered, like to way under a minute, so that it was, you could actually photograph things that were happening where people were moving around, okay? Um, and because people knew about where the battles were going to take place and when they were going to take place, um, the average person would, like, they'd pack up a picnic and go up on a hill and watch the battle. You know, that wasn't that wasn't unusual. Um, and of course, with the Civil War, everyone thought it was going to be a short war. Everyone said, oh, it's going to be over in a few months. We'll have the other side beat. You know, whether you were on the South or the North didn't matter. They all had the same idea that it was going to be very quick and victory would be theirs. Um, and before this war, before the Civil War, um, people had a very romantic idea of war, right? Men went off to war and they either came back a hero, um, a live hero, or they came back a dead hero. Um, and most people did not survive serious injuries, right? They, they, if they had an injury, they got infected, they got gangrene or sepsis, um, and pretty much croaked. So, so people weren't prepared for the scenes of mass carnage um, that Matthew Brady photographed. It was very shocking. Um, bodies strewn all over in various stages of, of destruction and decomposition. Um, it was shocking. It, it was disturbing to people. It was really difficult for them to deal with. Um, and at the time, uh, Brady had an apprentice, a guy named Timothy O'Sullivan, right? No, no relation to me. Um, who had a notion that what the American public wanted was to bring back the romanticism of, to war. Um, he went off on his own and began photographing the war, uh, the Civil War, in, in his way. Um, so O'Sullivan would find a really handsome corpse, um, one that didn't have much visible damage, um, and pose him and take a photograph. And then he'd write poetry to go with it. Um, and... Uh, like, say, a poem would be, Oh, what visions of loved ones danced before his eyes as he met his heroic demise. You know, like that. Um, and he'd send it to the newspapers. It was a huge success. Uh, and uh, he would... Uh, uh, and sometimes, 
if you found a really um, handsome corpse, uh, he would actually change the uniform uh, to the to the uh, opposite side uniform, and he would use the same corpse in the in the enemy's uniform basically, um, and take a photo with the same poem and send it to the other side of newspapers. So if he was um, photographing in the north for for the Yankees, then he would send it to the south to the rebels, right? And um, and that would be his that was that was his uh, way of of romanticizing the war. People ate it up. They loved it. Um, they loved the idea of, of making, uh, of having it seem like, like there wasn't really, even though someone was dead, it wasn't so bad. Um, and so it was highly successful. People ate it up. They wanted the romance to come back into the, into war. They didn't want to see these images of carnage and, 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 uh, destruction. Um, so it may sound kind of shocking that he would actually take a dead body and change its clothes and pose it, right? Um, but actually, it was rather commonplace back then. You know, people would take care of any family members who had passed away themselves. You know, they would wash and dress the body. Um, they would lay it out for viewing um, and goodbyes, say, in their own home. Right, they didn't necessarily go to a funeral parlor. They would, they would lay out the body in their home for people to to view and and to say goodbye to. And you know, depending on the weather, um, bodies tend to smell pretty quickly with it in hot weather. But a lot of time, you know, and then of course they'd have to bury them. Um, but a lot of times, the body might lay out in the home for several days while while friends and loved ones, neighbors, you know, would come and say goodbye. Um, so it wasn't unusual to do all this themselves. People would, would do this themselves um, uh, without an undertaker or mortuary um, involved at all. And, you know, they were, they were more used to personal death experiences back then. Um, remember, they didn't have antibiotics. They didn't have vaccines. Um, they didn't have sterile practices for surgery or, or anything like that. Um, so people mainly went into a hospital to die, not to get better. Um, so if you've ever been to an old uh, cemetery, if you've been to an old cemetery, you might have noticed something about the ages of the people that are buried there. Um, if you're looking at a cemetery from the 17 or 1800s, um, you'll notice that there's a lot of babies and toddlers. Um, many families lost half or more of their kids. Um, survival of in infants was not guaranteed. So you'll see babies that are just, a you know, anywhere from a few days to a few months old dying up to toddlers. Um, and that's the majority of the, of the people in the cemetery are, the, are these young children, these babies and children. Um, in fact, if, if, if you've ever seen a photo, an old photo of um, someone that looks like that their baby is, is sleeping and the parents are holding a, a sleeping baby, well, I've got news for you. It's not a sleeping baby. That baby is dead. Um, the family had a portrait made in memory of the last, of their lost child, and this was not uncommon back then. Um, it was not unusual. If if Grandpa croaked and you didn't have a photo of him, um, you'd dress him up in his Sunday best, drive him down to the photo studio, um, and get his portrait done. It was really common. Um, you'll see, uh, you'll see a lot of that where you see families, um, with, with children that are dead or any family member, if they didn't have any way to remember that person, why they would take a, a, a portrait of the person, um, after death. Uh, so that was, that was not uncommon and, it, but it seems a little weird and spooky to us. Uh, but you'll see it a lot in the 1800s um, and even up into the early 1900s. That was not uncommon, especially for children, um, because that might be the only time they have, only memory they have of their child. Um, if it's an infant, they may not have had a photograph of it before before it died. So pretty sad, but uh, but but definitely uh, definitely happened. So let's talk about a couple other milestones for photography. Um, one milestone was the first color photograph, which was done by Maxwell in 1861. Um, and uh, 
And then George, and then the other really big thing that happened in photography um, is George Eastman of Eastman Kodak invented roll film, um, which really made photography accessible to the masses. Remember, before this, um, you really had to be pretty, I mean, pretty much rich. You had to be wealthy to afford all this equipment and chemicals and stuff. Um, and you also had to be well-educated, so you had to be able to read and write, to be able to understand chemicals and how they mixed so you didn't, you know, create an explosion or hurt yourself um, uh, because the chemicals were very toxic. Um, and so George Eastman in inventing roll film, and, and so, and when they first invented it, um, they actually, you, you couldn't just go buy a roll of film, you had to buy a camera with film in it. And what you would do is, is you would take the camera, you would take all the photographs that were on that roll, then you would send the whole camera back to uh, Kodak Eastman Company, and they would develop the film and print photographs out and then put a new roll of film into your camera and send it all back to you. So you'd have to wait while they sent your camera back with your developed photos. Um, so it was quite a process, but it still was more accessible than it had been before, right? Because you didn't have to develop your own photos. Kodak would do it for you. So it's kind of an exciting thing that, that has happened with, the, with photography at this point. And, um, and now we're basically all historians. We're all documenting our everyday life um, with our phones and with sharing on so social media. Um, we've got, uh, you know, we've, we've got that happening. Um, so let's go back really quick to the be to the very beginning. Um, how did the idea of making a photograph come about? Where, where did that really come from? And we talked about the first photograph, but how did how did anyone even think about doing that? Well, it comes back um, to this an invention invention called the camera obscura. It's been around for over five hundred years and perhaps even longer. If you are a Spanish speaker, you may be aware of what the term means because of the because of Spanish's uh, Spanish Latin roots, um, obscura. It means dark. Camera. Think re camera. Means room. So camera obscura means dark room. Um, once it was discovered, artists yearned to find a way to make these images permanent. And what this was was basically a room with a tiny pinhole poked in a wall. And in that dark room, whatever was on the outside would, would be reflected um, on the opposite wall from where the pinhole was, except it would be reflected upside down. So whatever you were trying to paint or draw, um, you could basically trace it or copy it. And artists used this for centuries to do outdoor work um, or to, uh, to copy a, a, uh, a scene from nature, so to speak, right? Um, but they always yearned to have this, have this become permanent. And over the years, right, they, they, from a room, it became more like a small box. So it was very portable. Um, but once again, they really wanted it to become permanent. And so that's where William Henry Fox Talbot and Neps come in wanting to find a way to permanently affix an image um, that comes through a, a pinhole in a, into a, a room or a box, right? So that's our camera comes from this concept. Um, and so now, like I said, you know, we're all historians. We have cameras that, you know, not only film, but digital, so we can record stuff uh, digitally very easily. Uh, and we're going to, you know, be you know, thanks to these guys. Uh, we're, we're all, we're all historians. We're here recording our everyday lives. Um, and we have this most important and life altering art form to thank for pretty much everything that, that goes on in our lives. You know, all of our advertisements, all of the, all of the internet as we know it, um, movies, video, uh, geez, pretty much everything is, is linked to photography. So it's kind of a, it's kind of an amazing invention. And I hope you appreciate just how much it affects our everyday lives and what we would do without it. Once again, I want you to just think about 
a world without photography. What would that look like? Yeah, probably pretty much of a bummer. <laughs> pretty boring. Um, so anyway, thank you guys for joining me today. And uh, that was the lecture on photography. And we will see you soon.